Welcome, my name is Liis Kukkonen and this is Practitioner's Viewpoint. In this series of podcasts, I will be interviewing practitioners from different fields on how they see sedentary behavior and promotion of physical activity in their work. Today, I have the honor to introduce my guest, Dr. Richard Main. Richard completed his medical de- degree from Queen's University Belfast School of Medicine. He went on to complete a master's degree in sport and exercise medicine at Ulster University while undertaking training as a general practitioner. He is now practicing as a general practitioner in Northern Ireland in the UK. He is passionate about the research of sedentary behavior and physical activity to share information and help people live longer, happier and healthier lives. He is also running a website called themovingmedic.net. So in this episode today, We are going to talk about how to consult patients on physical activity and what does the research tell us about sedentary behavior among general practitioners. I am happy to introduce Dr. Richard Main. Welcome, Richard. Thank you, Lise. Yes, great to be participating in this podcast. So I'm going to start with the first question. Um, What is your background? How or why did you get interested in medicine and why did you choose physical activity to be in the focus of your research? Well, I always enjoyed doing science subjects in school, which is common with many doctors. Um, Interestingly, my mom uh, was a dentist, uh, so she tried to talk me into doing dentistry as a profession. However, I thought that if I agreed to do dentistry from whenever I left school, that I would be confined to looking in people's mouths all day for the rest of my life. I would prefer to have, uh, I, I thought I would prefer to have something that was actually more uh, all-encompassing than that. Uh, So I chose to study medicine because there are lots of different options within that. And I like to try and um, not be honed in on such a specific uh, field. Uh, So instead, by studying medicine and then going on to work in general practice, uh, I'm very fortunate to be able to deal with people of all age groups and backgrounds and lots of different medical conditions and not limited to just one specific body part or body area. Um, so yeah, I'm glad I've made the decision to to work in medicine. Um, it is quite a long uh, training pathway with lots of studying and and uh, and further than research uh, beyond that. Uh, but I'm enjoying my career so far, and I'm glad I've gone down this route. Oh, it's it's great to hear. I'm sure you have a lot of experience also regarding to the topics that we are going to talk about today. So. Um, in your blog, you write about your own experience um, when it comes to physical activity. And I would really like you to uh, share this uh, with our listeners. You were talking about moving from emergency department to work in general practice speciality, speciality training. So can you tell us this story once more? Yes. Uh, well, as uh, working in uh, training to be a general practitioner in the UK, um, you once you graduate from medical school you have to work for a couple of years as a foundation doctor when you rotate through different medical specialties to gain more experience and more expertise before you then choose to decide on what specific career path you want to go down um so i chose that i wanted to do general practice and even within then general practice training um i did uh continue to work in emergency medicine so i moved from working uh, in a busy emergency department for six months um, when during that time, during the working day uh, or night, because you were working at all hours of day or night, uh, I found that I was on my feet and moving around pretty much all of the time uh, because it's a big, busy department. You're moving from cubicle to cubicle and, and going between patients. And so... Yeah, I found that I was physically active pretty much all the time during the working day. And I actually really looked forward to getting the chance to sit down. But then I moved to working in general practice. And instead, I found that I was commuting in the car, uh, sitting down the whole time, quite a long distance. And then I was also revising for exams at that time. So I was sitting during my lunch break to try and fit in some more studying. And then I was sitting down almost constantly throughout the working day. Um it began with initially I had longer consultations with patients. So I had time to go and get them from the consulting room and bring them into, into the, or bring them from the waiting room into the consulting room, um, which allowed me to get up and move around between patients. But then actually one of the colleagues that I was working with was saying, your uh, call screen for the waiting room must be broken 
uh, we need to fix that so that they can we can be more efficient and get more patients in more quickly. <laughs> So uh, because the, the technology hadn't been working, I had, had to get up and move to get patients into the room, but they fixed it for me. And then I found that with the appointments starting to become shorter and less time between patients, I really needed to uh, try and read the notes, maybe finish making notes from the patient before and start reading the notes of the patient coming in next. And then I found with the call screen starting to work and showing my name in the consulting room, or in the waiting room, then uh, I started using that as well. So even that opportunity to get up and move was kind of taken away. And this was prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. So at least at that point, I still had time, I still had opportunities sometimes to get up and examine patients and things like that. Um, but it was just worlds apart from working in emergency medicine and working in jobs in, in hospitals as a, as a junior doctor. Um, I found it was a big change. Um, and then I, I started putting on weight and feeling lethargic and getting aches and pains. And it just got me thinking all this time that I'm spending sitting down, is, is this affecting my health? Because I really, it don't, it, I'm not feeling good uh, as mm -hmm. a result of all of this. And also what sort mm -hmm. of example am I setting to, to patients that are coming in to see me if I'm just sitting down pretty much all day, every day? Um, I'm not setting a particularly good example for my patients either. Um, so it was from that that I thought, I really want to look into this a little bit more and find out more about the health effects of sedentary behavior and physical activity. Uh, thank you for sharing this. Uh, I, you already answered my question. Uh, you said that you started gaining weight or putting on some weight as a, as a consequence of uh, sitting too much. Uh, were there other uh, health effects that you uh, realized or like noticed? during this even quite, I guess it was quite a short period of time or? or... Uh, well, yeah, it was a uh, six month. So I've been working in emergency medicine for six months, but I've been working for s several years in hospital settings prior to that. And then that was a, a specific six month placement in general practice. But from that, I knew I was going to be likely working in general practice for much the rest mm -hmm. of my working career. Uh, so that's why I was particularly interested to find out uh, whether all this time that I was spending sitting down working in general practice, whether this was going to be having an effect for my long term health. Um, mm -hmm. So certainly I noticed that I needed to change uh, whenever I'd been working in hospital jobs, I would always have brought uh, sandwiches <laughs> and, you know, quite a large lunch with me. Uh, and then I found mm -hmm. whenever I was working in, in general practice, I needed to bring a salad instead <laughs> because I just wasn't burning any, any uh, <laughs> ener energy. So I needed to eat less as a result. Uh, so thankfully that pre prevented too much weight gain, but I was aware that it could potentially be, be more problematic if this mm -hmm. was a, a long-term thing moving forwards. Did you have a chance to make a change in uh, in your uh, working, like what do you do now? Do you have a standing desk or did you have a chance to solve this problem? Well, yeah. So um, I suppose uh, I, 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 another reason that I got interested in looking at the effects of sedentary behavior and physical activity is I have a cousin who lives in Stockholm in Sweden and I was aware that he has had a standing desk for some time and it seems to be potentially more popular in Scandinavia. Um, so that's where I kind of heard of it from. It wasn't really something that was used very much in the UK. Um, but off the back of that, then I did uh, get myself a standing desk. Um, and so I do use a standing desk uh, in general practice now. Um, and I definitely much prefer that personally. Mm. Okay, cool. I'm, I'm sure this has also an effect on your patients. They see that you're using a standing desk. Um, but I'd like to go on for to the next question. So as a GP, you probably see a wide range of people daily. How often do you detect sedentary behavior being one of the reasons for the health concerns? How how general do you think this is, the problem? The well, problems? yeah, I've, I've never had a patient coming into me and saying, uh, I think I'm spending too much time sitting down. Uh, generally, we're dealing with the consequences of excessive sedentary behavior or physical inactivity. Um, so it's uh, because I researched that that area, you know, I'm particularly aware of that. Uh, and so I would be more likely to bring that up with patients. Um, so I, I think it's particularly rev relevant among the older population. Um, actually, one of the collaborators that um, I've been doing the research with is Professor Mark Tully at Ulster University, and they've been looking at the health effects of prolonged and excessive sedentary behavior in 
older populations as part of the sit less study. Um, and so it is something that I would be mindful of with dealing with more elderly patients, uh, because often once they're retired, then they potentially um, don't have the the need to get up and, and commute to work and, and move around in a, mm. a factory or an office or the work setting. Um, so instead, they could be spending a lot more time sitting in front of the television or radio and, and being much less physically mm. active, which does certainly, as the evidence has shown, have a very detrimental effect on their uh, health and well-being. I totally agree. I have noticed in at work that elderly people now during the pandemic, at least here in Finland, uh, when the pandemic started, then there was a lot of um, public talk about the elderly people being more, uh, you know, that the COVID is uh, is more dangerous to their health and could be a health hazard. So they were uh, asked to be kind of like inside or at least mm-hmm. people, elderly people understood that uh, they were asked to be inside, even though it was kind of like said that you shouldn't be interacting with other people. So mm-hmm. uh, for one and a half years, uh, there has been so little physical activity, exercise programs or exercise groups going on for elderly people. So I think also that the this situation is even worse for older people now than it was before the ben- pandemic. Yes, I agree. Uh, because I, I, I suppose initially, when the COVID pandemic first appeared, it, it, there was a lot of uh, it, there was a lack of awareness about how transmissible and contagious mm. the virus was. Um, but over time, we do have a good understanding that transmission is much uh, much reduced in an outdoor setting. So, mm. uh, particularly uh, during uh, whenever there are good daylight hours, uh, then it is a good opportunity for people to get outside and and try and exercise. But uh, that also depends on the places where people are living. And I know there were certainly a lot of uh, restrictions on on movement for people not being able to travel a greater distance from their house. So if people are living in uh, dense, uh, densely populated, built up areas, then it is particularly problematic for them. Uh, and so I think uh, it's important in future to consider the uh, the health consequences and detrimental uh, impact of limiting people's physical activity uh, and weighing that up against the risk of uh, obviously the adverse health outcomes of uh, uh, contracting COVID-19 and other uh, infectious diseases like that. Yes, definitely. Uh, You have also said that um, encouraging people who are physically inactive to increase their levels of exercise can be a challenging experience which requires a thoughtful and considered approach. So um, what is your approach? What do you think works well? Well, I I suppose in general practice, uh, there's sometimes a a saying to pick your battles. Uh, So, um, you know, there's sometimes people come in and they might have lots of different uh, health behaviors that are certainly less desirable. They may be drinking too much alcohol. They may be smoking heavily. They may be very sedentary. And I feel like sometimes it's tempting to bombard them and saying, you shouldn't be doing, you shouldn't be smoking, you shouldn't be drinking too much, you know, mm-hmm. you shouldn't be exercising, or you should be exercising more. Um, and it's important to consider the individual and try and maintain a person-centered approach because um, if you, if the person feels overwhelmed and bombarded with too many, uh, too much information and too much advice and too many instructions, then it's likely that they'll, just give up on all of it and not make any changes. So I think it's important to identify what is most important to the person, uh, you know, who is who you're dealing with at that time. Um, so it may actually be more relevant to to bring up with somebody that you, you may do more good, you, you know, by choosing to actually counsel them about smoking cessation as opposed to being more physically active. Um, so it's it's just working out what the priorities are for each individual. This is my personal thoughts anyway, um, what their priorities are and mm. their willingness to change and where they maybe sit on the uh, behavior change uh, wheel and, uh, and then working with them to maybe sometimes it's just planting a seed and putting a thought in their head that uh, maybe this is something I should be looking at moving forwards. Um, and I something sometimes say to people, um, I know that you could, you could be doing this, you, you could be doing that and being much, having much more healthier life, life choices. 
but uh, there's also you could you could do very you could have a very restricted and and confined uh, life uh, and be super super healthy. But if you don't enjoy it, then what's the point? You know, there's no point in living to be 120 and hating every minute of it. So if people, uh, yeah, it's up to people to determine what their priorities are and if they want to continue to engage in certain lifestyle behaviors that that they maybe enjoy, uh, then it's not up to me to stop them from doing that. Uh, but it's just picking what the priorities are and just being aware of the health risks uh, with some of their health behaviors. Definitely. Uh, so what is, maybe you already answered that, but I'm still going to ask, what do you think are the most common mistakes that healthcare providers do when consult consulting about physical activity and sedentary behavior? Uh, you mentioned about maybe giving too much information or do you, do you have you noticed what's, uh, what's maybe not done so well? Uh, I, I I don't know if there's a perfect uh, a perfect approach, uh, mm -hmm. and different things will work for different people. Uh, you know, different things will work for different clinicians, and different things will work for different patients as well. Uh, so I think the key is to maintain a person centered approach, so that you understand what the priorities are for the the person you're consulting with. Um, and it's yeah, it, it's not a one size fits all approach. Uh, you can't be going and giving out the same advice to everybody because <laughs> it's not maybe appropriate to be telling uh, a ninety year old granny to start going and trying to run a marathon. Uh, but it may be more appropriate to say, um, you know, you you go out and walk your dog for five minutes, uh, you know, in the morning and in the evening. How about trying to do six minutes uh, this week and, and seven minutes the next week and then make it a little bit longer or bring a friend along to, to make it a longer walk or go somewhere different? Um, and I think that's the most important thing. Uh, so, yeah, I think it, it has to be tailored to the, to the individual. So is there, like as a GP, you have so, there's so much to look at when a person comes in do you think there is time or enough time to um to talk about these topics with with your patients yeah i mean i i enjoy uh having these conversations with patients um but uh i know it's it's a, it's a, time is a, is a huge pressure in general practice in the uk uh, we still typically have 10 minutes consultations with patients uh, which is uh, they do come along then very frequently, very quickly. Um, and sometimes you feel like it's hard even to take a breath between uh, patients and move from one patient to the next. Um, there are some opportunities now uh, moving forwards. Um, both that things have been going on from before the COVID pandemic, but also in light of changes that have been made as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, something that's been going on certainly in Northern Ireland and other parts of the UK uh, and other parts of the world as well is trying to bring in other uh, allied health professionals and other health professionals into the the general practice setting. So it used to be that in general practice uh, there was the GP, the doctor, um, and a receptionist and a nurse, whereas now there are lots mm -hmm. of other uh, professionals working in the general practice setting. So we've got physiotherapists, mental health workers, um, social workers, um, and uh, advanced nurse practitioners. There's lots of more people working in the general practice environment. So potentially that does uh, free up more time to actually bring in uh, speaking to people about uh, their lifestyle choices and their, their behaviors. Um, as well as then the switch to uh, remote consulting. There's a lot more remote consulting now with consultations happening over telephone and video. That's a direct consequence of the COVID-19 pandemic, which is likely to be a long lasting mm. change. Um, and personally, I mm. find that is is beneficial in terms of having these <clears throat> longer consultations uh, or you know bringing in uh, sometimes some consultations ends up being longer if you're trying to bring in the lifestyle counseling element into it. Because you're aware that you don't have a waiting room full of patients uh, that are all waiting longer for every minute that you're running over with each patient. So in mm -hmm. the past, uh, it, it, it was often in the back of your mind that you really need to not have your, your uh, 
clinic running too much uh, over time because it's really not fair to people to be waiting in a waiting room for over an hour because you've taken an, another couple of minutes mm. with every patient throughout the, the, the session. Um, so instead, if things are happening over the telephone, some things are very quick to resolve uh, and then other things you can take a little bit more time over. Uh, so it's just, uh, yeah, it, it is a potentially a good opportunity now to, to actually, uh, if people are, are, are discussing uh, ill health, that's a consequence of lifestyle choices and maybe a lack of physical activity or excessive sedentary behavior. Um, now it is a good opportunity to try and bring that up with patients uh, because also it will reduce their, uh, potentially reduce their uh, future consultation rate if you can potentially stop them becoming diabetic or uh, you know developing hypertension and other things that can be prevented by adopting a healthier lifestyle although you have to invest that time more time up front it can potentially lead to time savings in future with them having less consultations in future yeah that's great to hear that things are developing and um, getting better uh, on I think I read from your blog that um, you find there to be few experiences more rewarding than helping people become more physically active. And I totally agree with you on that. Uh, would you like to share like, examples, an example or many examples with us about uh, where you have seen a change in someone's health uh, after yeah. they have changed their, their habits? Yeah, it can be very hard to predict uh, when your words will have an impact because mm -hmm. there are lots of people that I feel like I'm trying to say, you know, to increase their physical activity and 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 be less sedentary. And a lot of the time you feel like it's falling on deaf ears because they come in in future consultations months down the line and they say, you know, it's they, they haven't changed. But every so often, it does just seem to hit home with people. Uh, so I do remember fondly a time whenever I was working in a, a town called Balamina, which is in Northern Ireland as a trainee. Um, and I said to a gentleman who was uh, developing, he was uh, becoming type 2 diabetic, or he certainly, uh, his blood tests were looking that he was going to potentially becoming a type 2 diabetic. So um, I just mentioned to him about, uh, I, I talked through with him and asked if he was doing much physical activity and things and he really wasn't doing very much um and i explained like i try to do with with lots of different people about the benefits of of physical activity and the potential to improve his health um and i do remember that gentleman in particular coming in several months down the line with his blood test much improved and actually looking like he was kind of reversing the the trend towards becoming diabetic um and he just looked up himself and found that there was a local exercise class taking place in a church hall near where he lived, as well as a walking group that he signed up to. And just from making those changes and actually taking part in that, uh, he was certainly, you could see the objective findings in terms of the improved blood test results in terms of his cholesterol and lipid profile and his, uh, his risk towards diabetes. But also I could see it in himself that he certainly looked happier and healthier. Uh, as a result of changing his behaviors. Um, mm. And so that's hopefully something that he was then sustaining into the into the future. Mm. Um, I think as practitioners, sometimes you have the feeling that when somebody comes in from the door, uh, and I at least sometimes um, tend to think that I know who are going to follow my uh, <laughs> my guidelines or suggestions, but it's quite often... I see that I'm wrong. <laughs> There's like, you know, the more you work, the more you see that uh, you just don't know how people will behave. And it's, a, that's it's right. quite often very surprising. <laughs> and that's why it's good not to judge a book by its cover and, uh, and, and actually, yeah, yeah consider uh, how you're going to be yeah, discussing it with each individual person. Yes, yes. Uh, it's a great story. And I think it's also a great way to end up uh, the first part of our episode. So thank you everybody for listening. Thank you, Richard, for sharing your thoughts with us and stay tuned. We'll be back soon with the second part.